The following is a Need to Know Election 2012 special presentation. On this edition, Maria Hinojosa. This is the new America. Black, brown, gay, Muslim, you name it. We're a growing share of the population, but politically unpredictable. Together, we'll look at what these numbers could mean in this election year if we stand up to be counted. America by the numbers. When I first came to Clarkson, the Ku Klux Klan used to march in front of my house. But suburban Georgia has changed in some unexpected ways. We're sisters, you know, we were separated we at birth. Yes. <laughs> now, whites are a minority in Clarkston, Georgia, and it's home to refugees from 40 different countries. We work hard, we're buying for close homes. Yeah, I'm probably a, a racist or redneck or something, I don't know, but you wonder sometimes if I've got any buddies anymore, like, you know, that think the way I do. Should white America be afraid of becoming a minority. America by the Numbers is made possible by the members of the National Minority Consortia, the Center for Asian American Media, Latino Public Broadcasting, the National Black Programming Consortium, Native American Public Telecommunications, and Pacific Islanders in Communications, by the Ford Foundation, and by the Marguerite Casey Foundation. Need to Know is made possible by Bernard and Irene Schwartz, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Miriam and Ira D. Wallach Foundation, Josh and Judy Weston, the Cheryl and Philip Milstein family. Corporate funding is provided by Mutual of America, designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. The numbers make it irrefutable. We're living the largest demographic change in history. We asked social trend tracker Guy Garcia to help us make sense of the latest census numbers. Guy's an expert on the new American mainstream. The new mainstream is the combination of great demographic changes, explosions in the populations of African Americans, Asians, and Latinos, even to a certain extent women, young people, LGBTs. 110 million African Americans, Asians, and Hispanics with buying power that exceeds $2 trillion. Today, already, one in three Americans are multicultural. When you look at the population under 18, it's already closer to a one-to-one -one ratio. As the demographics change, so does our electoral map, especially as the share of white voters continues to shrink. We saw it in 2008 with the election of basically a new mainstream president. Who voted for Barack Obama? It was young people, it was educated whites, and of course, it was so-called minorities, people of color. By 2042, demographers project that we'll be a multicultural majority nation. Should white America be afraid of becoming a minority? They should only be afraid of becoming a minority if it's within the old definition of what a minority means, marginalized, left out, disenfranchised. The new mainstream is inclusive. Everybody is welcome to the new mainstream. America has always been redefining itself. The unfinished pyramid that the founding fathers constructed, the idea behind it was that America was a republic that would only be completed by the people who came after. It used to be that this idea of the new America was happening in urban places, Los Angeles, New York, uh, Miami, Chicago. It's everywhere. In fact, most of the steepest growth of multicultural populations in the 2010 census were places like uh, Arkansas, Iowa, uh, Georgia. And in Georgia and the rest of the South, this change is happening faster than any other part of the country. Over the last 10 years, it's the South that had the greatest increase in multicultural growth. This new multicultural America is not what's next, it's now. Welcome to the New American South, 
where these numbers live and breathe. In Clarkston, Georgia, whites became the minority by 1990, and now it's home to refugees from all over the world. I came here because this city is a laboratory for the future of America. I wanted to see what democracy means to some of the newest Americans in this election year. so different from so many different countries. It's, um, it's pretty incredible. Congratulations. So what's the name of the new baby? Benjamin. Benjamin? Yeah, Benjamin. Baby Benjamin Notuan is a brand new American. His parents fled the repression of a Burmese military junta and moved to Clarkston three years ago. Today, they celebrate another child born into freedom. What do you dream about Benjamin's future as an American? <laughs> president. You want him to be president. Is that your idea or your idea? I do see. Why do you want Benjamin to be president of the United States? Uh, I think that this is the democratic country. Everybody can rise on president. Named after one of America's founding fathers, Benjamin is a bridge from a persecuted past to a wide open future. In this Ellis Island of the South, could there be lessons for a divided nation about democracy and getting along? We're sisters, you know, we were separated we are, at birth. Yes. <laughs> we tell everybody. Clarkston is just outside of Atlanta, Georgia, and was handpicked by refugee resettlement agencies because it had cheap housing and public transportation to nearby jobs. Since the early 80s, thousands of refugees from Vietnam and Somalia, Iraq and Bhutan, and some 40 other countries have come to this area to escape war, persecution, and massacre. What is this here? This is a knife. When the bullets finish, the slaughter the kids. These were your children? Yeah. And she's got a bullet in her hips. And I have a bullet and another knife here. Another knife wound here, too. Mm. And you were left for dead? Yes, I was. I was in the mortuary. They was going to bury me. You were in the mortuary? Yeah, two days. Two days, ready to be buried? They want to put in the white cloth. To get here, I was beating. And they felt the pulse? Yeah. Like Amina Osman, who came from Somalia, many refugees in Clarkston are recovering from the trauma of displacement and war, and they're struggling with a new language in a strange place. They're welcome to this country with some government assistance, but soon are expected to provide for themselves. It's a big change for the Clarkston natives, too. In less than three decades, this city of just over a mile square has gone from being 97% American-born to more than a third foreign-born. Somebody told me, yep, Clarkson, we're the dumping ground. It puts a lot of stress on a city. It puts a lot of stress on the people in a city, on our infrastructure, our police. It's a huge problem. Clarkston, Georgia, has faced its share of change before. First home to the Cherokee, it was later settled by poor farmers of British descent. And for most of its history, Clarkston was overwhelmingly white. There was a sense before that someone like you, a black man from the north, represented serious change in a place like Clarkston. Definitely. You were unwelcome. I don't fault anybody for their prejudice. For me, people are trained to be prejudiced. Emmanuel Ransom grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia and moved to Clarkston, Georgia in 1963, the year Martin Luther King marched on Washington. When I first came to Clarkston, the Ku Klux Klan used to march in front of my house right down here off of uh, Ponce Leon. The black neighborhood used to be across the tracks there. Was the city council all white men? Yes. Was the mayor a white man? Yes. And did you feel like you were excluded? Yes. Clarkston is nestled in the shadow of Stone Mountain, Georgia, known at the time for Ku Klux Klan cross burnings. The side of the mountain is still carved with the busts 
of the Fathers of the Confederacy. When um, I was a kid, my daddy used to take me out to Stone Mountain and we watched the Ku Klux Klan, and they would take an old car up on top of the mountain, set it on fire, and push it off the front of the mountain, and everybody would scream and holler. You talking about exciting. Graham Thomas grew up in nearby Decatur, Georgia, and moved to Clarkston in the 1980s. Your dad took you to oh, see yeah. Ku Klux Klan rallies? He was not the Ku Klux Klan. He was from uh, New Jersey, matter of fact. He was, as we call down here, a Yankee. A seismic shift began in the 1980s. Clarkston went from being 90% white to majority black. Now, this city of 7,500 is less than 14% white. Stone Mountain is a theme park. And Emmanuel Ransom is Clarkston's first African-American mayor. What does it mean for you to be in a place like Stone Mountain now? Well, it means that times change. For Mayor Emanuel Ransom, change has been a good thing. For his friend Graham Thomas, a Juilliard trained musician, maybe not so much. Have you ever thought that in your town here in Clarkston, that you and your wife and your family are now the minority? Oh, certainly. Here, we are the minority. And what does that feel like for you, a white man yeah. from the South? Yeah, as an old Southern boy. You wonder sometimes um, if I've got any buddies anymore, like, you know, that think the way I do. There's enough in it. The convergence of the old and new South has never been smooth. It was no exception when the refugees started arriving in Clarkston. It's, it's just destroyed the way of life, so to speak. There'll be a young girl pushing a baby carriage with two babies in it, and she's pregnant again. Now, who's supporting that? We are. They dump them in these apartments sometime and don't tell them how to light the stove. They build a fire in the middle of the floor and burn apartments, or they'll drink out of the commode. They need to be taught the American way so that they don't goof up. I've heard this a yeah. couple of times now, yeah. that the refugees build fires in their living rooms to cook. Has anybody actually seen that? No, it's just hearsay. You said that you've heard that they drink water out of toilets? Yeah, I don't know that that's a fact. I'm just hearing it from people that say it. I, I'm probably a, a racist or a redneck or something, I don't know, but I just see it destroying uh, what we had planned to happen here. In one of those odd twists of fate, Graham Thomas does have at least one thing in common with the refugee arrivals. He also came to Clarkston to take advantage of low-priced real estate. He bought and renovated three houses, hoping they would be his nest egg. And I shouldn't gripe about all this, because it's, it's helping somebody. But my little nest egg here, so to speak, seems to be in jeopardy. While Graham Thomas laments the plummeting property values, the new Americans I met are busy building businesses and putting down roots. Hijab. Hijab, Islamic dress, the store mainly owned by Somalians. Omar Shakay is the president of the Somali American Community Center. The Somalis started arriving in Clarkston in the 1990s, and now they make up the largest group of refugees here. So, and this is also Khamis. This is for men. Omar helps newly arrived Somalis transition into life in the U.S. Here is her salon. It's owned by a Somali woman called Yasmin. This man also runs our website. He's also Somali. It's like being in little Somalia. When you come here, you already have hope that if you cannot make it here, you cannot make it anywhere else. An accountant, his name is Ahmed. We are trying for him to run for the mayor. Do you ever have other Americans who come here? Yeah, a lot of black Americans. What about white Americans? Do you ever see them here? Very, very, very limited. What do you think about that? You know, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, when you talk to them, they always say it's ethnic, you know, so. The people who are in the political power, they just believe immigrants are here to drain the resources of the county. They're not looking the other side, that we work hard, we're buying for close homes. We are revitalizing the economy of this county. Refugees do own about 85% of Clarkston's businesses now. 
but Clarkston's economy is struggling. Unemployment is more than twice the national average, and a quarter of Clarkston's residents live below the poverty level. But it seems to me that democracy is thriving among these new Americans. We educate people, and we tell them the rights the Constitution is giving them. Most Americans are not spending their days talking about the because, Constitution. Because they are very comfortable with their daily life. For them, it's like a routine thing. But for for you, us, it's important. The Constitution, the Constitution is alive. The Constitution is alive. Our survival depends on the Constitution. Everybody's voice is important to this debate. Not the one person, not the conservative, everybody. At Clarkston's monthly city council meeting I attended, a rainbow of old and new Americans lined up to make their voices heard. I just want to express my appreciation to the mayor and his team for putting up the neighborhood bulletin. You know, it has been really helpful for people like me to connect with the city. I appreciate chief of the police, CPO, to help us with a blanket and mattress for the new people from Bhutan. Despite the diversity of voices at the mic and within the community, the Clarkston City Council is all white, and all six candidates in the last election were white as well. We are here tonight to witness the swearing in of three council members who were voted in with only 13% of voters showing up at the polls. Together, we need to figure out a way to improve civic engagement and to move the city forward. We're going to move forward with our agenda, and we're going to get our officials sworn in so we can have a quorum. When nobody registered except for the, the six people who were all white Americans, I was very disappointed. Is that a failure of democracy? We as a council have to do something about it. It's not going to change itself. We have to change it. And there were some encouraging signs of change in this year's city council election. You are Diane's campaign manager. I am the campaign manager. Self-appointed, and then I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> she told you I'm going to be your campaign That's manager? That's right. She says, you stick with me, and you will get elected. <laughs> she decided that I needed postcards with my picture on it so she could hand them out and people would remember who I was. And she decided she needed a t-shirt to wear all over the place with my picture on it. In a field of white candidates, Amina Osman became a power broker behind the scenes. You understood that part of what you needed to do as a smart politician was to get the vote of these former refugees. It was Amina's idea. Honest to gosh, I'm not taking credit for it. And in fact, Diane, you ended up getting the largest number of votes. That was my secret weapon. Hello, hello, hello. How, are hello. how are you? Pretty, how are you? Hi, Pretty. Pretty. Councilwoman Diane Leonetti might just be a shrewd politician, but she says she's hoping to bridge the divide between old and new Americans in Clarkston with Amina by her side. What doors was she opening for you? Oh, just to meet more people and to see what their vision for Clarkston was, see what their vision for America was. She said, come meet this guy. He wants to meet you. He's from South Sudan. And I think it was the first time that anybody really reached out to really want to know, what are you thinking? Where's your heart? What's going on in your life? Even though you were Diane's campaign manager, you couldn't vote for her. Now I'm not American citizen. But if I could be an American citizen, I could vote for her. <laughs> Every Saturday and Sunday morning, in a makeshift Hindu-Buddhist temple that doubles as a classroom, Brinda de Kaul's citizenship classes are packed with Bhutanese refugees clamoring for the right to vote. Can you tell me what is the capital of the United States? Washington, Washington, D.C. No one here has ever voted, and many were stripped of citizenship in their homeland. How did the name Washington come? What does it mean to you to have this many people here wanting to learn about becoming American citizens? If I am able to help some more people to regain the pride of becoming a citizen, I think that I would be helping a lot for my community. Marinda DeCall was the first refugee from Bhutan to settle in Clarkston. His goal is to help every one of his fellow Bhutanese 
make the transition he just made, becoming a U.S. citizen and a voter. Hi. Are you the only one registering or is everyone? Oh, everyone. everyone. People in America think democracy is given to them. Oh, I don't need to vote. I, you know, something like, but for us, it's so important because we are doing for the first time, you know. I'm always confused with this word Asian. Now, we are Asian or not? No, yeah. What does that mean to go in, cast a ballot for someone like you? That is the time I will feel that I belong to a nation, that I am helping the development of a nation. So in this new America, it's becoming clear that learning about new cultures and adapting to change is a two-way street. I saw it firsthand at one of the few American-owned businesses left in Clarkston. If you hadn't been open to change, do you think that thrift town would have survived? No. <laughs> it would be gone. I mean, it was almost gone. It was within about 10 days of being gone. <laughs> I was getting more closed on. 20 years ago, Bill and Karen Mellinger's Thrift Town Grocery was on the verge of going out of business. As more and more refugees arrived, the Mellingers hired a Vietnamese cashier, and they listened to her. We went to different little Asian stores. She helped me uh, decide what would sell, what her mama bought at the other stores, what her grandma bought. Eventually, we were finding the products they wanted, and uh, been a start to climb. What was your first reaction when you saw that Clarkston was changing? Oh, thank goodness. When I bought the store, this was a pretty low-income neighborhood. It was a rough environment, and it has changed dramatically since the immigrants have come in. Do you think that our country is a country that is open and prepared for that kind of change? Constant? I don't know that it matters what is happening. Well, I mean, that's it's how our fact. country started. I mean, my grandparents were from Italy. Yes, my it's from Germany. Germany. Do you understand fear? And people say, I don't understand them. They're well, they don't understand us, so imagine their fear. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're, they're a little more frightened you know? than they are. You should have seen some of these girls that are on the registers when I first hired them. They were terrified. They overcame a lot. It turns out Mayor Ransom overcame some fears of his own. You, in fact, said that you originally wanted to get involved with city politics in Clarkston because you had a problem with the refugee population. Yes. Now, the fact that you, at one point, as a black man, looked at this international community and said, I don't know if you all have a place here. It makes you feel like an ass, actually, because I knew better. Meanwhile, a huge number of new Americans are becoming citizens. So how might they affect the 2012 presidential elections? If they stand up to be counted, multicultural voters could be the margin of victory in highly diverse states that until now had been reliably red, like Georgia or Arizona. We know that in 2008, Obama carried 80% of all non-white voters, and that the share of these voters has grown in every state. Political scientists forecast that in 2012, Obama could win with just 38% of the white vote. But these are projections. The new Americans I met, just like the old, are pretty hard to pigeonhole. What a difference in my life. There's a difference of opinion now. My dad, I think he's still trying to decide whether he wants to be a Republican or a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm strictly Ron Paul. I think I'm for him. Less government power. For me, the big issues are health care. So I guess I would go towards Democrat, like Obama. <laughs> I, I want to keep his health care. Me, I haven't decided yet. <laughs> I have to think of it. <laughs> but most probably Obama, because I have liberal views, and I like his health care policy, so. Gay right, they call it the abortion. I never grew up with this kind of thing, so I tend to be a little Republican, you know, very conservative. Yeah, I'm pretty socially conservative. So do you support the Tea Party? Yeah, I would. Do you talk about these things? She knows my views. Yes, I know her views. If you could vote, you would vote for Obama again? Direct. Would she... you vote for Obama? No. And you don't want to convince Amina? No. But she's your campaign manager. But we are not sister because of party. We are sister because we are sister. Yeah. Can Clarkston, in fact, survive without the refugee international community? Half of the citizens that used to be here have moved out of Clarkston. Our refugee community is the majority now. And how are you going to survive without them? Now, what would happen, Graham, if a refugee 
decides that they want to run for mayor. I probably wouldn't vote for him unless I could get some assurance that he knows what he's doing. Will you run for office, Amina? Yes. When I get my citizenship, I'm going to be a mayor. You're going to be the mayor? The mayor of Crackstone. <laughs> did, you, did you know that, Diane? No, that's news to me. <laughs> I'm going to be a mayor. Why not? That's it for now. I'm Maria Hinojosa. Thank you so much for joining us on America by the Numbers. America by the Numbers is made possible by the members of the National Minority Consortia, the Center for Asian American Media, Latino Public Broadcasting, the National Black Programming Consortium, Native American Public Telecommunications, and Pacific Islanders in Communications, by the Ford Foundation, and by the Marguerite Casey Foundation. Need to Know is made possible by Bernard and Irene Schwartz, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Miriam and Ira D. Wallach Foundation, Josh and Judy Weston, the Cheryl and Philip Milstein family. Corporate funding is provided by Mutual of America, designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. The Futuro Media Group. Trusted, in-depth, independent. BBS.